Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. We are going to be talking about opera today, and we're going to barely scratch the surface. Opera is a huge topic, so I'm breaking this into two parts. Um, one video we'll do today, the next one next week. And even then, it's there's there's so much depth that we could go into that we're just... Uh, what I'm aiming to do here is give to give you guys an overview, as opposed to like a really intense, microscopic, detailed look. So I want to start this video off by telling you that it's not like I was born loving opera. I really, really couldn't stand it in my youth. Like I loved singing along to all the pop songs on the radio, but opera to me was just this like incomprehensible, abrasive uh, mess of vocals that just meant nothing to me. And I didn't get it and I didn't like it. But there's a lot of things in life like that. And I always relate things back to food. But sometimes we have a tendency to try something once that's new. And then we're like, oh, this is weird. I hate it. And then we never try it again. And a lot of the times that repulsion is just because it's new, because we don't understand it. So I mean, how many of you actually enjoyed the taste of beer or black coffee or uh, like olives the first time you try it? These are acquired tastes. And the more you try them, the more you can develop a taste for them. And I find opera to be basically just like a strong cup of black coffee. And even though it's not like my absolute favorite thing in the world, like it's not like I'm spending all my free time listening to operas, I have watched probably about a dozen operas in my day. Never live. That's a sad thing for me. I really want to see live opera. But it's cool because you can watch full operas on YouTube with English subtitles or you know, whatever language you speak. And without that, like, there, it's just the only way to live. Without the subtitles, I would not like opera nearly as much because then you miss the whole story. But I'm going off on a tangent here. Basically, my goal in this video and then the next one is to give you what... I needed to appreciate opera. And that was just basic understanding. The reason I didn't like opera is because I didn't get it. And just through learning a little bit about it, through learning about its forms and functions, I was able to then appreciate it. And I also want to give you a couple starting points for if you want to watch an opera, I have some suggestions in this video that you can check out and all that. So let's get started. Opera is basically the original musical theater. Singers in a traditional opera will generally alternate between two different types of singing. One of them is recitative singing, which is it's kind of almost like early rapping. Um, it doesn't sound anything like rapping, though, but it's half spoken, half sung. And then the other type of singing is arias, which uh, th that's like the actual catchy tune. And in opera, you can expect drama complete with acting and a storyline. And you can expect music with a small orchestra and vocalists. You can also expect costumes and scenery and sometimes there's even dancing. So we'll get into specific details shortly but as an overview opera was born in Italy at the end of the 1500s which is around the start of the Baroque era. It's been a long sustained and evolving art style. It's continued on for hundreds of years which is much longer than many other styles and genres and tons of famous composers have written operas such as Handel, Mozart, Wagner. Um, honestly like most composers have tried their hand at opera at one point or another with varying degrees of success. Opera didn't just like appear out of thin air one day in the late 16th century Italy. Toward the end of the Renaissance, a style called monody became more popular. See, okay, so here's how it worked. Music had become incredibly complicated in the Renaissance, especially towards the end of it, with these crazy multiple layers of vocals and there was no way to understand what the words of the text were because everything was overlapping. So people started to crave something simpler, and that's where monody entered the equation. And that style was usually just like a single voice over chords, much, much simpler. And the point of it was to convey a dramatic and emotional message. And then this, in turn, ended up evolving into the aria from an opera. At the same time, theater was a big deal across Europe in the 1500s, as we know from Shakespeare. And theatrical performances featuring music did exist and were largely used for big celebrations like weddings. There were a group of prominent artists living in Florence who had a vision of changing the musical and theatrical landscape of Italy, as, you know, young artists tend to want to do. They basically had artistic celebrity house parties, which were full of music and drama and literature and I'm sure really intense conversations. And these guys were really into Greek drama and what they really wanted to do was bring it back and make it cool again. From that, the first opera was born in 1597 called Daphne, after the Greek goddess, written by Jacopo Peri. However, 
This opera has been lost to the sands of time, unfortunately, so the honor of the earliest opera that's still being performed today is L'Orfeo by Monteverdi in 1607. So that's how the earliest operas came to exist. It was some combination of the musical and theatrical landscape at the time. And there was also quite a bit of work from the Florentine Camerata um, intellectuals who wanted to revitalize Greek mythological performances. But it was in the Baroque era, which was starting around the year 1600, where the word opera first came into use. It wasn't until around 1640, but operas did begin to exist in the early 1600s. And the genre quickly spread across Europe, just uh, it didn't stay confined to Italy. So it was also in the Baroque era where opera originally started in, you know, wealthy courts just for like private performances, but then it spread to larger public performances and concert halls where it could be you know, viewed by a wider audience. The Italian word opera literally means work, as in two meanings. So this is hard work, or it's a beautiful artistic work. And the word was first used in 1639, well after opera had already been existing for a while. And basically the meaning is a composition in which poetry, dance, and music are all combined. Monteverde continued being critical to the form, and he wrote many more operas in the mid-1600s, including, uh, aside from L'Orfeo, he wrote the Corn of Papia and the return of Ulysses. These early Baroque operas tended to blend a little bit of comedy with a little bit of tragedy, which did offend some people who had finer sensibilities. See, high class folk at the time preferred their opera to be serious, whereas the growing amount of new wealthy people who were often from humble origins enjoyed a little humor and sometimes crassness in their opera. So because of that, opera began splitting into different more defined forms, which you can see here. So opera split into opera seria, serious opera, opera buffa, comedy opera, and then Commedia dell'arte, which is basically like comedy improvisational theater, which isn't actually opera at all, but it did grow from the early operas. So we'll start by taking a look at opera seria, which is the early form of opera, also known as in English, serious opera. And this type of opera is mostly made up of two musical components. You have the secco recitative, which just means dry recitative. This is the sing talking that we were kind of talking about and it's usually only sung over top of basso continuo which is just like a couple instruments so it's pretty sparse and then that's contrasted with long da capo arias and these are like the really virtuosic full orchestra pieces more instruments more voice i kind of mentioned this already but i like to think of recitatives as like the baroque version of rap music even though it sounds nothing like rap it's just the style in which it's it's sung it's like half sung but also half speaking and then you have the decapo arias which are these elaborate and florid melodies usually like super melodic they have lots of movement lots of tune and soul and these were basically like a platform for a really great singer to show off their chops they were usually extremely difficult and meant for virtuosos both men and women took lead roles and sang these arias in soprano voices so for men that meant they were castrados who were taking the roles um, a really famous one is farinelli and then you also had women sopranos who were featured in these lead roles like faustina bordoni so opera seria became a really big deal in Europe in the late 1600s and early 1700s, everywhere except for France, because the French did their own thing and they had their own opera. And even though this Italian operatic style was spreading all across Europe to places like Germany and England, where you know they had their own different languages, um, composers would still write these operas in Italian. So for example, Handel, who wrote operas in England for London audiences would still use an Italian libretti. Like he would still use Italian text because that was just the fashion at the time. Anyway, let's back up a moment and get back to Monteverdi, who was, as we know now, one of opera's innovators. Basically, any serious study of opera will include a full watch through of La Orfeo and the coronation of Papia. Okay, so here's how things are gonna work for this video. And I got my reasons for this. So it's virtually impossible to find public domain operatic performances at copyright free performances. And that's how I roll with this channel. I don't wanna, you know, infringe on any copyright. But I also feel strongly that a 30 second clip that I play for you of a three hour opera 
is like way too minuscule to give you any sense of the genre. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave links on the screen that you can click through and check out. And honestly, like the best way to get to know opera is to just watch one, watch it like a movie, pick one with English subtitles and sit down with some popcorn and have a good time. I'll show you a few that you can do that with. And I'll also show a few excerpts as well. So I'll leave you the links here on the screen if you wanna click through them and check them out on YouTube. I'll also have the links available on the associated blog post for this. So what I've got up on the screen here is the full version of L'Orfeo, but I've also pulled up In Un Fiorito Prato, which is a little excerpt, and it, it should give you a sense of what a Baroque secco recitative sounds like, and that's where, that's like the dry recitative where there's minimal accompaniment and it's kind of like half singing, half talking. So anyway, the translation of the title is In a Flowery Meadow. It's super passionate. This messenger Sylvia sings it and she's talking about the details of Eurydice's death. I mean, as I'm saying this, giving synopsis, synopses of opera like never makes sense just because it's super weird and detailed. But anyway, hopefully that gives you a little bit of context if you check it out. As time went on, the genre of opera Syria became more and more convoluted. It became less about the story and more about the crazy vocalists showing off all their mad skills everywhere. One composer who was very critical about this direction change was Christopher Gluck, and he said that the music must always be subservient to the drama. So what he went and did is he created his own operas to display his ideal, including a fairly famous one called Orfeo et Eurydice. The melodies weren't wild and showy, and the harmonies were much, much simpler. This was also around the beginning of the classical era, and Gluck's work would go on to influence classical composers like Mozart, and then later Wagner. To get a sense of Gluck's simpler tastes, I'm going to share a link with you from Act 1, Scene 1 of Orfeo et Eurydice. And this is titled, Ah, se in torno a quisterna fiore. Nesta. It's got English subtitles and the whole opera can be found on YouTube if you want to check it all out. Basically what you're going to be seeing here is a sad and grim moment as Orfeo is mourning the death of Eurydice and there's like nymphs and shepherds singing the chorus and stuff. It's great. So now let's talk about Mozart who took Gluck's simpler philosophy and just ran with it. Though he did compose several operas uh, in the opera seria genre like Idomeneo. The genre by his time was basically out of fashion. This is this is the mid to late 1700s, and his opera series didn't have much success. But where Mozart really shone and made his mark on the operatic landscape was in the genre of opera buffa, which is my personal favorite genre. Not to like sway you or anything, but it's a good one. Opera buffa is a genre of comedy operas. They're like the romantic comedies of yesteryear. As a rule, they have a happy ending, heavily feature a love story, but there's usually like some obstacles and complications, involve plenty of innuendos and crass language, and they feature everyday people and everyday settings, which was a big change compared to the fantastic and mythological settings and characters of opera Syria. Mozart wrote some excellent opera buffa, which includes The Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni. I've watched them both and they're really great first operas, like if you've never watched one before, because they're really approachable to the casual viewer and they're funny. When we're talking about Mozartian operas, we really have to mention the librettist Lorenzo de Pont. So basically, Basically, his job was to write all the words. So he wrote the story, the lines, and Mozart did all the music. And his name isn't as famous as Mozart's, but it was basically a 50-50 venture and they worked closely on a lot of operas together. I'll leave you a link on the screen to the full version of Marriage of Figaro, which is a little bit of an accomplishment to get through it over three hours long, but it's absolutely worth a watch. And you can divide it up if that seems like an intimidating amount of time to you. Basically, it'll have you right away from the introduction, which you'll probably know the introduction to Marriage of Figaro is super, super famous. And I really just feel like he brought this like fresh, irreplaceable spirit to the opera. Like there's nothing like Mozart's operas and 10 out of 10 would recommend it to you. So just because Italian opera was like the main dominant force across Europe, doesn't mean that other countries weren't sort of formulating their own different versions of opera. We've already mentioned, and we'll talk about this in a minute, French opera was like its 
entirely own thing. An Italian opera never became popular in France. But there were other countries like Germany developing their own unique style. So Germans developed singspiel, which is what it sounds like, a, like singspiel, singspeak, uh, a type of um, opera that was both sung and spoken. And then you had natural born German composers like Handel, who chose to write in Italian. But there were composers like Mozart, who popularized singspiel. Whoa, you, that was, do you see that hair flying in the air? Hair flying in the air like you just don't care. It's like I'm throwing confetti or something. <laughs> okay. But then Mozart, I mean, who else, entered the scene and wrote some singspiel, which allowed German opera to hold more prominence in Europe. So among these famous singspiel he wrote are Il Seraglio and The Magic Flute. Later, Mozart would go on to pass the singspiel torch to his successors Beethoven and Schubert, who I didn't picture here for some reason, and finally Wagner, but we're gonna talk about those guys in part two of this video. I wanna share with you a recording of the Queen of the Night singing an aria from the Magic Flute. It's from act two, scene three, and it's a really famous little tune. Even if you think you don't know, you probably will. If you skip ahead a little bit of the dialogue, you'll probably recognize the impressive vocal hopping. And I love the subtitle for this one. Hell's vengeance boils in my heart. This tune is all about murder, and it's kind of funny because the background music, it, the tune is like actually pretty happy sounding, so I love it. Instead of absorbing the Italian opera tradition, the French just created their own. It all started with Jean-Baptiste Lully's opera Cadmus et Hermione, which was written in the genre of uh, musical tragedy, basically. Uh, and these, this genre featured mythological stories, kind of like opera Syria. Um, but they didn't necessarily end tragically, contrary to what the name suggests. The main concern for these operas usually be that they're noble and elevated. Since these operas were specifically designed for the French language, the recitatives are unique and, and they move differently than Italian operas, since the contours of the language are different. Another unique feature of French opera was how each act would end with a divertissement, which involved big courses, group dances, and a big visual spectacle to appeal to the public. The French also weren't a big fan of castrados like the rest of Europe, preferring their male roles to sound a little, little bit more like men, although they still use like higher male tenor voices. Jean-Baptiste Lully, considered the father of French opera, wrote Cadmus et Hermione in 1673, along with the librettist Philippe Quinault. And the two of them continued to release yearly operas in the musical tragedy style, which would then go on to influence successors such as Rameau and other French composers. The French also had their own version of opera buffa. Um, it had a lot in common with the German singspiel, like a mix of singing and speaking, uh, but it was called opera comique, or comic opera. Now, the big difference between that and opera buffa is that even though there would be comedic elements, it didn't necessarily have a happy ending like opera buffa basically predictably always did. So it's like the difference between a romantic comedy and just like a standard drama. And that is all for today's video on opera. I hope you've learned something. Definitely, definitely, like if you do nothing else, watch The Marriage of Figaro. I mean, Don Giovanni's great too. Basically, like you can't go wrong with a good old Mozart opera to start yourself off. It's a good like three hours of your life spent. I mean, if you're just gonna watch Netflix anyway, might as well like have a little bit of an educational entertainment session. So I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for everyone who helps make these videos possible. For all of you who comment and, you know, give these videos likes and everything, I really, really appreciate it. So see you later alligator. Sorry, my cat just jumped on my lap. I don't think you can see this, but it was very distracting. Hi, kitten. Hello. You're hungry. Was in the genre of opera buffa. Did I just mix it? Did I say genre? <laughs>